Today we're going to focus on prayer, not despair. Say prayer, not despair. Not despair. Amen? Amen. Some of you already know some of the scriptures. So I'm going to see, make you finish this particular scripture. It says in the word, where does your strength come from? From the Lord, right? Where does your strength come from? The Lord. Where does your strength come from? The Lord. And who's the Lord? The maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 Say Jesus. Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. We're going to start off with some questions because folks, we started with this sermon uh, to be anxious for nothing, and we focused on that scripture that says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Turn to song means always. Can you rejoice in the Lord always? Yeah. When things are bad, good. I say it again, rejoice. Paul is saying this while he's in prison. Yes. Let your gentleness, whether good or bad, your circumstances, no matter why, he says, be gentle. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, he says. He says, do not be anxious about anything. What does it mean not to be anxious? What does it mean not to be anxious? Don't worry. Don't worry. Turn to somebody. Don't worry. But then he says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, turn to the person, in every situation, what, what situation is he talking about? Good or bad? You say good or bad? Yeah, I'm going to give thanks, good or bad? But I have the plan. But he says, but in every situation, by what? With thanksgiving, present your what? Request to God. And then he says this. Then he says, and the peace. That's the peace. Of who? Of God. What is the peace of God? And we're going to get deep today, folks. I want you to know. Because the Spirit is leading us to go to another level in our walk with us. It is time to get out of this complacency. It's time to break free. If you've been serving the Lord a long time, you know, a lot of times that complacency sets in. We get so comfortable. We get religious. Whether we don't think we're religious or not. We go into all these formalities, all these traditions. All becomes that. And that fire that's supposed to be in us, that Holy Spirit. It's, it's craving for us to sort of, let's go next to the next level. And so he says, in the peace of God, which what? Which Trans does what? Transcends. Now tell me about what that word transcends. What does it mean to you? Go above. Okay, very good. Exceed. Think about it. What, what do you hear and transcends? What does it tell you? Exceeds. Exceeds. Separate. Separates. Changes. Changes. New realm. Goes beyond, our Goes beyond our circumstances. This is what God is saying that when you understand His word is true, this is what God's word is going to do for you. And we got to sort of see it this way because there's scripture in, in Psalm 91. You know, many know Psalm 91 by heart, right? Yeah. But it's saying remain stable and fixed. He says, don't deviate. Hold on to who you are and who you belong to. And then to remember whose power no foe can withstand. See? And so when he's talking about this particular, it says, and again, the, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will what? Guard your heart and your mind. And those are the two things we got to sort of protect all the time. All the time. So praying all the time. Now there's a scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, 17, and 18, which says what? This is, I want you to remember this and hold on to it. Really hold on to it deep because there are some things we're going to be talking about today.
day, like for example, what stops you from praying in the first place? Think about it. What stops you from praying? Naruto. Guilt. Guilt. Busyness. Anxieties. Distractions. Procrastination. Too busy. Pride. Pride. Hold on to that. Because sometimes we don't we miss sight. Believers don't think that they have any pride. That's right. But the pride is what keeps you from fulfilling what God calls you to do. Amen. And you're going to see how subtle the enemy works with us with this particular pride. When we get into it, folks, I'm going to have you guys discuss this. But here in Psalm 91, it's saying to make sure that we stay, uh, we remain stable. Don't panic. Stay fixed on what God's word is telling us. But here's Ephesians. Put, get to work, put out your word. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Jesus is telling them, take the helmet of salvation. Let me go. Pause here. The helmet of salvation. When you put on the helmet to play football, what are you putting it on for? Right. Right? But when God says put on the helmet of salvation, what is he asking you to do? No. He's telling you to protect your mind. mind. But protect your mind from what? And he is very specific. The details are specific. Because he said protect yourself. The helmet of salvation is there. You know, and the whole scripture says, but I'll take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? Which is the word of God. And then, and then he says, and then what you do with it? Pray. And when we start teaching on the Holy Spirit, you got to understand, when people struggle with depression, despair, all those things that are there is in the mind. And God is saying you need to protect yourself. You see, depression, despair, you see what does that? And people don't realize. Pride keeps you there. Pride, believe it or not. Pride keeps you with that despair, with that depression. It keeps you locked in, bound. And we're going to see how in a few minutes. But he's telling you, protect this. Because what are you protecting yourself from? He says how the enemy attacks you is he gives you doubt. To doubt God. To doubt God's word. To doubt God's truth. And that's how he gets you. And when you fall trapped to that, what's your defense? See? You have nothing if you don't put on that helmet of salvation. That has to be there. That's the first thing he says. And then he says, then, he says, pick up the what? The, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests all the time, in all occasions. No matter how big, no matter how small. But you ask yourself, how do I pray all the time? You see? And he's telling us, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. You know? It's, if, if we understand the, the habitual pattern that we have to learn. That your, way, your very way of life becomes a prayer. You see? So that your very life becomes a prayer. And you don't care. You don't have to isolate yourself when these things are happening in your life. You got to make sure, how do I make my everyday life a prayer? So, we say, making prayer your life. How do you make prayer your life? Come on. How do you make prayer your life? Discipline. What else? Determination. That's right. Conscious effort. That's right. This is a. Using opportunities to pray for people. That's right. Now, yes. Just being mindful of that. Mindful. He is with you all the time. Mindful. That's right. All the time. You could be walking down the street, something up. Let me pray for that. Lord, this is it. You know, it's like throwing it out there. It has to be habitual. Because if it's not habitual, at this point, it's just going to come whenever you feel like it. 
And that's what prayer has become for some folks. It just comes whenever you feel. When you're, when you're in desperation, then you're going to need to pray. And then you don't do it in the spirit. Because when it says pray in the, in the spirit, it implicates what? It implies what exactly? See, I'm going to get you to think because at this point, we have taken for granted what God has said to us to do. How can anyone pray at all occasions? One way is to make quick, brief prayers. But make it that habitual. Every time, every day. So you can get used to understanding that you are, as Elder Marie said, a house of what? Prayer. Prayer. That's who you are. You could walk down the street, see what people, you walk down the street in New York, you see something crazy all the time. You see homelessness all over the place. What's, what's taking place there? Demonic things going on everywhere. So what stops you from praying? All those things you said. Are you trying to find your own solution? Because if you're not praying, you're trying to find your own solution. We don't do the things we're supposed to do because now we're taking matters into our what? Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Do you think there's no point in praying? Are you weary because you haven't seen change in a hard place? And there's a reason for all that. Whatever it may be hindering you, listen to me right now. Don't wait to pray. God is listening to you right now. Turn to someone and say, He's listening to you right now. So when he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving presenting your request to God. Hold on to that because at this point we're going to go at this point to a level where you truly get to a place where you know how that works. We want you to understand how it works. All right? And so the Apostle Paul tells us that never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will. Whose will? God's, God's will. To all those who belong to Christ Jesus. Some of us pray with thanksgiving when we think of something is to be thankful for. Get a job, a relationship. All oh, it's wonderful to pray in those moments. It's easy to pray when we heal. You know, we get all these things. We can pray. It's easy to do that. But if we are honest, most of us pray when life gets uh, difficult and when we need God to intervene. Some people will only pray when they are desperate. When you're praying only when you're desperate, mm -hmm. why is that a problem? Think about it. Again. Why do you think that's a problem? When God hears you either way. But there's a problem with that. You see? Because you're saying, God's not really first. I am. I want us to understand that prayer is important. Always, folks. Some people only pray when it's, if they're desperate. They send the SOS prayer. They call everybody. They get on everything. It's just this time. But folks, this is, this is what God wants to say to us. Pray before you get in place of desperation. Pray before anything happens. Things are going to happen regardless. You've got to be praying. Pray while you're in the place of desper uh, desperation. That's okay. Pray after you've been delivered from a place of desperation. Pray always. Turn to someone. Pray always. Pray always. Is there a storm in your life that we need to be feeling, uh, you're feeling desperate? desperate? You know, it's not easy to fall into despair. Uh, it causes us to isolate. Yes. Me. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants to separate you. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason one of the things that Jesus is telling us why it's so important to pray is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, when Jesus is in Gethsemane, and he knows what he's going to face, and he's asking God, take this cup from me. And he's praying. And he actually takes the three disciples aside. And he says, I need you guys to pray with me. And, and at this point, you know, uh, as he's saying, the way to overcome temptation is to keep watch and pray. Watching means what? Being aware 
of the possibilities of temptation. We cannot, we just neglect the fact that the enemy is always looking for a way to bring you down. We just, you just walk around in life as if, you know, and the enemy is just waiting for opportunities. And God tells us, yo, you got to be on point. Sensitive to the subsidies, you know, how subtle we can be. And, and, and to be spiritually equipped to fight it. So that you're not taken by surprise. We can't be taken by surprise. I can get up one morning and say, oh, I got a feeling this, but I'm not surprised. I know what the enemy is going to try to do. Get out of here. I don't want to get up out of here. What? I'm out. You have to fight that. Otherwise, it'll take you out. And some, some people, it takes a long time to get out of. And so God is telling us, Let, it's time for us. And Matthew is telling you, Jesus is telling him, hey, the enemy is going to attack you when you're most in your vulnerable state. He'll have a field day with you. So he's saying, yo, you can't, you can't, and don't get to that place. The disciples couldn't do it because they were weary. They were fatigued. So they kept falling asleep. And Jesus kept waking them up. Get up and pray. You don't want to wait. You want to discipline yourself so that you know that what needs to be done, you do it. Not what you feel. So often it's based on what we feel and we lose sight. So I want us to understand this, this time of what it means to prayer and not despair. Because at this point, you're going to need to know the difference and know what to do. Is this obstacle uh, giving you a feeling of hopelessness and depression? The obstacles are there. Let me tell you, I had a, a, a childhood. Recently, I was telling my daughter, Jay, that recently I've been getting all these uh, things about my childhood. And, man, devastating childhood. But, you know, I remember when I was two years old, I think I might have shared this before. And I'm sitting on top of, um, I'm standing here watching my brother's father beat my mother on top of her, beating her in her face and blood coming everywhere. And he, he's just pounding on her, so she pretends to, you know, to be unconscious. So he gets up to go get water at the bathroom to wake up and finish the way you started. And she, as he moves out, she gets up and runs right past me and, and leaves. And I'm just, I'm frozen. I'm you know, at this point, devastated, you know, two-year-old watching this at this point, you know? And so he comes back, he sees it, and he runs out, and I'm just there. Maybe a week later, days later, uh, we go back to the apartment. And I walk into the apartment, and I notice the curtain, you know, blowing, the air is blowing in it, and I point to the window, and she goes to the window, and the window is broken. So she figures, oh, he must have broke in again. So we go to the bedroom and she, we look under the bed and he fell asleep under the bed. He was waiting for us to get home, but he fell asleep under the bed while he was waiting. It, it, I don't know how long it took before I, had, I was able to go back to that apartment. Sometimes the traumas that we go through in life, and we don't realize that we have traumas that we have not faced. I used to go to the movie theater when I was a kid. And as soon as I saw the first sign of blood, like, you know, the letters in the beginning of the movie. There was a Dracula movie, I remember one day, and the letters started to come down in blood. I was panicked! I lost it! I could not watch or see the sight of blood at all. For years. Something automatic. And this is what the enemy does. And we don't even realize that it has that kind of power over us. And we get depressed, and we don't even know why we're depressed. We panic, we don't even know why we panic. There are things that here we have to sort of understand. Today, I could probably do surgery. See? Pull out my own tooth not too long ago. <laughs> you do it. But you can, you can make prayer your life, and your life a prayer. And that's what we need to do moving forward. We're going to have to get to that place 
right now? Are you desperate? In a desperate place? Pride keeps you bound in despair. Depressions. And we're going to go through this right now so you understand what God is actually saying. Psalm 91 tells you that God is our what? Shelter and a refuge away from everything else. We're going to need to understand what that really means. Because once you understand this principle and you actually know how to pray on all occasions, and we're going to use a story. The story everybody knows, I'm sure. The story of Jonah. You guys heard of it? Yes. All right, we're going to go into the story of Jonah. So the book of Jonah. And we're going to go in there. And I think I brought my phone. I was going to read it. Uh, but we'll open it. Chapter 1, the book of Jonah. And what's the story with Jonah here is that he, he is God. He's the prophet, right? And I'm going to read from the uh, message. I thought that was really cool. Uh, one day a little long ago, God calls, war comes to Jonah. God tells Jonah, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. I want to preach to them. They're in a bad place. And in verse 3, but Jonah got up, and what does he do? He goes to him and he runs away. So often we don't see how we run away, folks. You see, we don't even know that we are running away. We think that we are serving God, but, you know, the times of despair, desperation or depression can set in at any point in time, and you do the opposite of what God's telling you to do. And you're not even aware that you're doing that. Now, we can say Jonah knew what that guy was doing, but Jonah has some issues. How many of you know what was Jonah's issues? Why didn't Jonah say when God said, go to Nineveh and preach the gospel over there, and Jonah says, not me, I'm going over here. The opposite way. Why? Yes. He wanted the Ninevites to pay a price. He wanted them to be punished, killed even, because they had hurt him. They've done damage. He has scars. You know, when someone does you wrong really bad, you know, the natural instinct is to want to get even. But he was unresolved. You know, he was depressed in despair. Why? How do you know that? If you read down, when he goes into the ship, pays his fare the ship to run away from God the other way, you know, he goes, the storm comes on a boat. It says, and, and this Translation, it tells about the, the water was so high, towering high, that the, it was what it says the ship was about to break into pieces. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation. And where was Jonah? He was crawled up downstairs in the, in the bottom of the boat, sleeping. He couldn't even get out of bed. He wasn't concerned about what was taking place around him. When people are in despair, they can't, cons they can't see themselves associating with anything. They're in their own little world. Ship is about to go down. What is he doing? He can't even budge. So these guys do lots. They call lots. They go say, who's, who's, who's at fault? Folks, and this is very important. Because so often when we get into those places, we don't realize how you hurt not only yourself, but those around you. You're doing more damage to them than to yourself. He, the people that were in that boat were going to die because Jonah was in that place. And the last thing you want to be is be responsible for someone else. You sometimes don't care when you're in that place. Take me home, Lord. But what about everybody else? And that's where Jonah was at. And God, and God was teaching a lesson here. So Jonah, you know, tells the people, throw me out into the ocean. After they determine it's your fault. They had Jonah, and they threw lots. That's how they prayed back then. They threw lots, and it all came down that Jonah's fault. And so they finally went down there and said, Jonah, your name came up. I mean, we all here panicking. You like can't even bud. Get out! Who are you? Where you come from? What's going on? And he tell him, "Well, you know, God told me to do this, and I didn't do it. You know, I serve the God of the heavens, the seas, and all everything else, and He told me to do something, and I didn't do it. So the only way to stop this is throw me overboard. That's what He tells him. Throw me overboard, and this will stop." They hesitated. 
Because they figured, listen, if God's doing this to you, to us, because you're running away, can you imagine what he would do to us? Think about that a minute. So even when you're in a place like that, they were more concerned that if we even touch you, if anyone even touches you, what God would do. Think about their perspective. And sometimes we can't even see that. How much God would love you. They understood how much God would love his people. That if they were even to touch him, what would, what would be the results of that? Hold on to that. But sometimes when we're in despair, we, we can't see nothing. We're blind. So Jonah says, you need to throw me overboard. So what happened to him? What happened to Jonah when they threw him overboard? He was swallowed by a great fish. That's right. He was swallowed by a big fish. It could have been a whale. It could have been something bigger than a whale. Who knows? But they say he was in the belly of the fish for how many days? Three days. How many days? How, many, how long will you say people are in the belly of their fish? Months. Years. Even a lifetime. We go over the same old thing over and over again because we are still in the belly of a fish. It's time to get out of this fish, folks. Don't you agree? It's time to start looking at things the way the world looks at things. You cannot see it that way any longer. But we have to be responsible. I call to you from the land of the dead. This is what Jonah said when he was in the belly of the fish. What did he do? I'm going to read this. So I want you to follow really quick. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from inside the fish. He said, I cry out to the Lord in my greatest trouble. And he answered me. I called you from the land of the dead. And Lord, you heard me. God bless you. You knew me into the ocean. Uh, he says, you threw me into the ocean depth and sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath the wild and stormy waves. He said, no matter how mad, the seaweed was all over my head. What does the seaweed represent in our lives when we in a place of despair? They keep going over the same old thing. It's almost like you're walking around with CB all over you. We just don't want to face the reality that you'd rather just say, uh, this is it. This is going to really change. Next is your choice. Because God says, even Jonah in the belly of the fish, with CB all around him, he was able to pray and cry out, I need this to change. I need this to stop. I need to get it over this once and for all. And God said, what? You need to know that God hears you. Turn to someone. Say, God hears you. God hears you. And Jonah said, Oh Lord, my God, snatch me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And he, in his earnest prayer, he went out to you in your holy temple. Verse 8. Those who worship false God turn their backs on all God's mercy. What are false gods? You see, we are more dependent on what we can do on taking control of matters into our own hands. We can actually wait our money to come to see if I can get another job. As he was saying, maybe another job would do it. You're trying to find other solutions other than God. But I will offer sacrifice to you with song and praise. I will fulfill all my vows. He says, I'm going to commit to you, Lord. Jonah then was spat out in the beach. But here's now, as far as Jonah and the world were concerned, he was good as dead, right? Yeah, his prayer, a prayer inside the fish belly, based on his knowledge of God's mercy and kindness in the fish, Jonah would be totally disoriented. Yet, he says he will look towards the temple of God. Despair is where there is no hope, where a person doesn't want hope that offers, that is offered. Despair can take over if we decide to give up hope. 
many people are trapped in their despair because they do not want help that God has the God the you know, help that God has offered us. They don't want it. They want it on their own terms. If you want things on your own terms, that's pride. I won't do it until I see this. I will push through this because until I can see it, I won't do it. You want things on your own terms. What they call that? Pride. Pride. Many people are trapped in their despair because they have that pride that keeps them there. Running away, withdrawing, avoiding, all that stuff, procrastinating, that is all pride. Psalm 62, verse 5 to 8 says, reminds us, let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken, my victory. That's what God said. Honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, my rock, where no enemy can reach me. So let's, let's, let's talk a little about this now because is hope in God or hope in yourself? Do you know him as your rock in salvation? This is the question for you. Do you know God as your rock in your salvation? Okay, so we're going to fo focus on finding out whether you're going to really pray and understand the importance of praying or you're going to stay in despair. All right? Is he, is he your unshakable fortress, would you say? Is he the one that can't forsake you? Is God your refuge? Because we can say it all the time, because God's my refuge, but we won't do what God's telling us to do. So is he really your refuge? But our tendency is to go right back to what we're comfortable with. We may have committed to the Lord, I'm going to do this, and then as soon as you get too comfortable, you go right back. You don't follow through on your commitments. You say he's my fortress, but I lack. There's a purpose in your pain, folks. In your place of desperation. You have to pour out your heart to him. A test is for no other reason. It is there to help you turn to God for help. It is there for that reason. He wants you to turn to Him. Otherwise, you're turning somewhere else. Change can come. Your miracle can happen. You don't need to be stuck inside your fish. Today, a lot of us are stuck in our little fish. May not, may not seem like a big fish. And we need to pray ourselves out of this. We don't usually see this as pride, by the way. And this is where it becomes a problem. We don't see how we're being prideful. Because if you're not really trusting God in the things he's telling you, like, let's, let's, let's walk out here. Jonah had to decide whether he would give up or give in. It should have been an easy decision, but it, it took him three days. Why did it take him three days? My question to you. If you are very in your circle, why does it take us so long when we are in that place of despair and in depression? In depressed? Yes? It's comfortable being uncomfortable. Like you get stuck in a mess. Okay. Think about this a minute. Yes? I don't think your body can survive more than three days without water. So it must have been his lowest point. His okay. His most desperate. Yeah. Like breaking point. But what's happening before that? The first two days. What's happened in the first two days of your getting into that place? Denial. Yeah. Denial. 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 Good. That's right. And how does denial work? I got this. I can find a way out myself. I don't need nobody's help. But can I go through it first? Huh? 
know, a lot of people don't panic. You know, you get the news that if sometimes, so often, uh, you get news in the mail, and all of a sudden you can panic right away. Yes, but it doesn't go to, to go to God right away. You can start panicking as soon as the thing happens. Doesn't mean you go to God. Yes. John was angry. Yes, he was. Yes. Yeah, he didn't want that. He wanted his own way. He thought, God, you should do this. God wanted to save them. Jonah wanted to kill them. Yes. He wallowed in his despair. He wallowed in his despair. You know, we can get so comfortable. Matter of fact, a lot of, you know, I'm a Malachi, so I know. We can get into that place and just dwell in that place. You know, you can just stay there and just wonder. And I can easily convince myself I'm seeking God. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with God. That's right. That's right. It is all a part of a this. Again, the enemy is doing what to the mind? Deception. You see? We should not wait not a minute. It should be straight to God. Lord, I want this free. Uh, you cause it. I need deliverance right now. Amen. Amen. Don't wait. Amen. No, I'm, I'm getting up with I don't want to get up. Well, I'm getting out. I don't care. If you got to do this. There's no time. The longer you stay in there, it doesn't only hurt you, folks. It hurts everyone around you. Do you feel you know what's best? If only God and everybody else would line up. You have that attitude? That's called what? Right. It'll keep you stuck in your despair. And it stands in the way of your deliverance. It won't give you the freedom. God wants to deliver you from everything and anything you're facing right now. I just want you to know that. All right? I got, I got some stuff we need to deal with. This is very important. And you're going to be having a discussion in a minute. If you, don't only, uh, if you do only what you want to do, that is pride. That is what Jonah suffered from. He didn't agree with God, what God wanted him to do. He didn't agree. He didn't think, why should I have to go through this? So he gets angry because he, God's not doing it his way. Who knows best? He said, no, God, I don't think that's what I want to do. Jonah had allowed his pride to determine how he would serve God. And that's a problem. We have our own understanding that if, if I did it only this way, then I will serve God under these circumstances. I will commit under these circumstances. If it's convenient, this is when I would accept that. And folks, it doesn't work that way. If you want to be truly delivered, walking in the power of His Holy Spirit, you need to understand that it is about God's will being done, not yours. If you're in this situation for quite a while, there's a purpose for that. He was willing to serve God, but only on His terms. Think about whether we're doing that right now. Maybe we need to examine ourselves and see if God, uh, if we are really serving God or just simply doing our own thing and calling it service for God. And that's where people get so confused. They call this and they think they're serving God. And you're not having anything to do with what God's calling you to do. It sounds good. It may even feel good. It may do all those things, but you're not following God's plan. If you're struggling with trusting God. See, Jonah realized that he had a choice. He could turn from his hard-hearted and sinful ways that would live or he could be hardened in his heart and even die. Go further and die. He could have chose that. If you're struggling with trusting God, I remind you of Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, when God spoke to Moses, to the Israelites and said, I have, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Mm -hmm. 
Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. He's saying you and your seed. He's saying you have a choice, but the choice that you make will not only affect you, but affect your generations to follow. This is very important. By God's grace, by grace of God, Jonah chose life. So Jonah, what did he do? He repented. Turn to someone. He repented. <laughs> Repentance literally means what? Change of mind, heart, and attitude. It means seeing sin for what it uh, it is, an act of rebellion. We think that we're serving God and all we're doing is rebellion against God. And then turning from sin and submitting to God. So not only do we repent by, you know, acknowledging our rebellion. And first, we don't even want to acknowledge our, You know, I've talked to a lot of mature believers. And I could help them with certain issues. And then I tell them, okay, the final thing is, you're going to have to give up the pride. I don't have any pride. They don't, they don't have no pride. They, because they're not really submitted. Because if you're truly submitted, you'll follow through. Finish. Follow through all the way. Don't, don't hold back a little. They always want to hold back a little something. I only, and they don't realize that it's always on their terms. This is not about your terms, folks. Not at all. Rebellion has become a problem. It, it says it's a change of mind that results in a change in our behavior. So if I say I'm trusting God and He's my rock, if something happens and I go back to the old pattern, what, what is happening? Do you really trust God? Are you really committed? Have you even acknowledged that you, are, you have this pattern? Because if you acknowledge I keep making the same mistake or I need help, that's, that's good. But if you keep just going back to the same old thing, then folks, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Jonah recognized him going to his own way and doing his own thing. He was running away from the only one who can help him. Because he had a problem, what should he have done? If he had a problem with what God, instruction God gave him to do, what should he have done? Yes. Okay. Submit. And if you had a problem with that, ask God, why are you sending me over there? Why me? Exactly. Why are you sending me? I have a hard time with this individual. You know, there's a lot of dudes that I don't even want to talk to. And those are the very people that God sent to me too. Why would he do that? Think about it. If he said you have a hard time with someone at work, you can't get along with them. They always... You know, to get the worst out of you. And God's saying, I need you to go to them and talk to them in a nice, gentle, loving way. <laughs> Why would he send you to do that? It should be difficult. Test your faith. What? Test your faith. Test your faith. What else? It's like you're in training. You're in training. But you say you trust God, but you're not willing to what? Submit. Okay? You still want your own terms. Send someone else. But at least if he would have said, God, can you send someone else? God would have said, no, this is for you for a reason. I have a purpose for this. Now think about it. Let's go deeper. And I want you to take a one, 30 seconds, only 30 seconds, because I've got to be closing. 30 seconds, think about this a minute. If Jonah were to go to God and say, Lord, why are you sending me? You know how I feel about that. 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you. What do you think God would have told Jonah? 30 seconds, come on. I mean, you get the news working right now. What do you think he would have told him?
10 seconds, folks. Think about it, because next week, we're going to go into that, the second level of this. Ten seconds, time is up. Now, I'm going to ask you this, before I get you guys to give your answer. Was Jonah uh, sin his pride? Or was it an act of rebellion? All right, let me hear your answers. I need to throw that out there before you give me. All right, so here you go. Jonah went to God and asked him, why are you sending me? What, what do you think God would have told him? All right, who wants to go first?
So often we're still holding on to stuff because we like the idea. We got so comfortable with our dysfunction that it's become normal. We have a world system that has become normal. This is when we deal with the life and the spirit. We've got to understand the difference between the world, the flesh, and the devil versus the spirit. We have become so conditioned this way, that's what we, we see. You know, when I study, when it says uh, being a shelter, the, dwell in the uh, shelter of the Almighty, it says, dwell, it says the only place you can get to God's shelter in that place is the two things. Dwell, what it means to dwell in God's presence, and how to rest in His presence. And when we talk about Christ, when we talk about rest, Christ said, you rest not in your work. You see, so often we take it that we, we have our own perspective of what rest means. And He says, rest in your work. Don't rest from work. Rest in your work. But we don't know that. Because the world's perspective of rest is reclining. We're going to focus on the three things that this repentance involves three things. I want you to keep this up though, because we're not finished with the way Jonah, God called Jonah, just the way he calls you and I. You are all his priests, priestesses. But let's, let's focus on what God's going to do moving forward. Let's bow our heads. Right? Cause I'm 